Please welcome to the stage Lori Siegel and Takedra Mawakana. I'm so happy to be here with you today um, and, and to hear about everything you guys are doing. Quick audience survey. Um, how many folks here have taken a ride in a Waymo? Oh, wow. A number. Very cool. And, and what's where? Just shout out a couple. <laughs> San Francisco. Right. Okay. 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 So this is a crowd that like knows what's up. Um, how many would like to? Okay. All right. Um, so, Tikidra, you are the co-CEO of Waymo, um, and I want to get into a little bit of your history as a leader because I think it's, it's super interesting and relevant for this particular company in this moment. But I'd love to start with, and it sounds like the audience is pretty familiar, so we don't have to stay here too long, but a little bit of the history of Waymo. It started as Google's self-driving car project, spun out of Google's R&D lab in 2016. That was a minute ago, so yeah. give us a little bit of sense of where you guys were and where you guys are, are now. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so in 2016, as you said, we spun out from Google and became an alphabet company, though still. And the idea of a moonshot back then when we were first founded is really if technology can be used to improve the lives of humans, let's figure out how to use it. And so that's when Google Self-Driving Car Project was born. To become Waymo, it had to be deemed at least viable as a concept. And that's the time that I joined the company. It was really to think about how to commercialize this technology. Because you can build technology in a lab, but if you can't actually figure out how to make it, what people will use and integrate into their daily lives, then you're not actually going to realize the mission. And so, over these last, you know, almost seven years, since then, since 2016 when we spun out, it's been this mission of one, continuing to build the Waymo driver. One of the biggest decisions that we made right after spin out was that we are not gonna build a vehicle. We're gonna focus on building the driver and that we would partner with companies, automotive companies, and buy vehicles and then upfit them with our driver. That was a really important moment for us, right? Because it's about staying in the lane of doing what you're really good at and also partnering with people who had hundreds of years of experience in building cars, which is what they're really good at. Um, after that, it's really like, how do you drive towards consumer sort of adoption, education, community engagement? And so one of the earliest things we did was we were the first company to issue a safety report. And that's because at the time, there was a permissive sort of uh, regulation at the federal level encouraging people to voluntarily submit these safety reports. And we were the first company to do that. And it's funny now when I think back because we had a raging debate on how to use a regulatory filing um, to educate. And that's what we did, you know, it kind of looks, it's available on our website, and it, it kind of looked like a magazine, right? It had images, it really described the technology, the hardware, the software, the compute stack. Um, and so, of course, we took some heat because it was like, this isn't a serious regulatory filing. But on the other hand, we got a lot of credit because it was the beginning of us learning how to go from a lab to a business that intended to put these cars on the roads and ask people to you know, pay for a service. And so one of the things we had to do was educate about the technology. Why should you trust it? What does it do? How does it work? So we answered those questions. And even looking at that, if you look at your history, um, you went back, you joined in 2017 before you were co-CEO. Um, you became, uh, when, when you joined the company, before you were at AOL, Yahoo, eBay, um, and I saw something you said about when you were interviewing for the role, and at the time the role was um, global policy. You said um, in an interview, at first I thought it sounded terrifying. Yeah. And I was just saying to her backstage, like, she helped with, like, mass, look at mass surveillance, like, during the Snowden era at Yahoo, like, has seen a lot of stuff. And you were terrified joining. You saw it as, like, a challenge. What about it at the time was, was scary, was, was challenging to you? I think it was the, a lot of regulatory frameworks exist for technology, and it's really a question of retrofitting them for the new advancement or the new innovation. In this case, what I knew is that if the technology works, 
then everything would hinge on whether or not there was a regulatory framework to commercialize it. And that just felt like what I refer to as a money where my mouth is moment. Like if I really think I know how to open a market, if I really think I can develop a strategy that's sort of worthy of the trust of the community around the technology, then this is the opportunity for me. And that was like terrifying, but I thought of it like, if it doesn't terrify, you shouldn't do it. So it was. Um, and now give us, give us where you are now. Where can you actually ride in one of these vehicles? Where are you going? Um, and I think it's like over the last, even in the time they announced that we were doing this interview, there's been headline after headline of, of Waymo now going on highways, going here, coming to this market. Can you give us a, a quick overview of where you can actually ride in one of them? Yes. So I'll start with the market where we are, and then I'll sort of go back to our first market. So starting here in um, Austin, Texas, we are testing and validating our vehicles across about 50 square miles um, downtown to East Austin. And we're really excited because by the end of the summer, we will have rides available to the public, um, or by the end of this year. And um, so we're really, really excited about that. Right now, employees can take rides. In Los Angeles, uh, starting tomorrow, we're actually going to have from Santa Monica to downtown LA uh, limited access for members of the public. Hmm. And in the coming weeks, we will start charging for those rides because a couple of weeks ago, we received our CPUC permit uh, to allow us to do so. So that's really exciting to us. The two markets, which I heard a few people say LA when you asked the question, but the two markets that we've sort of scaled over time are San Francisco and Phoenix. San Francisco is all 50 square miles um, and it's 24 by seven. We had about 200,000 people on a wait list. The majority of them are now in the service. And so we will eventually go to what we think of as no wait list at all as we continue to go through that wait list. And then in Phoenix is where we have 225 square mile territory since October of 2020. Um, that service is available 24 seven and it includes the Sky Harbor Phoenix Airport. So you can fly in, grab a Waymo from the curbside, go to your location downtown Phoenix or out to Scottsdale. And so just to give a sense, cause we always say 225 square miles. I mean, that's like 10 times the size of Manhattan. Hmm. And so it's not only the longest running fully autonomous territory in the world, it's also the largest. And so we feel very proud of the amount of progress that we've made over time in Phoenix. And I mean, first Austin Riders later this year, that's new, right? That hasn't been announced. So that's news and that's same, right. with, same with, same um, with, the first public writers in, in LA. That's right. um, you know, there's always the promise of self-driving cars. As I've been covering tech for 15 years, which makes me ancient, I would say, in the tech <laughs> community. But I remember it was 2015, Elon Musk came out and said that self-driving cars that could drive anywhere would be here in two to three years. And then you had then Lyft CEO, John Zimmer, 2016, say that this would all but end car ownership by 2025. Like, it's 2024, so we've got some work to do. Why have so many of these predictions been, been wrong? I think it's because it's the engineering challenge of our generation. Like, it's a really hard problem to solve. In what sense? I think, you know, getting from the concept of doing a fully driverless demo, which is where I think a lot of companies can kind of get to, and we certainly spent a lot of times in the early days doing demos, to fully autonomous, where you remove the driver from behind the driver's seat and can fully trust the technology, and you don't ask the human to take over after inviting the human to be distracted and not drive. That is, you know, we're still the only company in the US that's ever done that. Um, and we first did it here in Austin in 2015. And I just think it's because it's, it's very, very challenging. The number of scenarios that you have to plan for on the roads, I mean, our cars have seen everything on the road from, you know, mattresses to people to, you know, bags of trash to, you know, elderly people walking the wrong way on a high speed road. I mean, you really have to be able to react to the world around you. It isn't a pre-programming notion. 
And so it takes a lot of time and then it takes a lot of investment. And so I think, you know, we learned our lesson in the early days. We would predict, you know, how soon we were gonna be here or there or doing this or doing that. And we've just learned that it takes so much humility um, to really understand the kind of learning journey that we're on. And if you are willing to be thoughtful and guided by what you learn, then you realize there's, that we're not making any grand bold predictions because it's safety critical technology and we shouldn't go any faster than the technology allows. And by the way, everyone, I'm gonna uh, open it up to questions with 15 minutes to go, so please think of those questions too. You said something to me before. You said technology moves faster than people's expectations. Um, this, this being driverless cars, autonomous vehicles, moves slower than people's expectations. That's to the point of what you were just saying. Yeah. There's just, the stakes are high because it's, it's human autonomy too that we give up to go into these cars. That's exactly right. And I think that, you know, when I first joined Waymo, like my mother said, well, well, like why? Like why would, like why would I get in a car without a driver? And I think you have to overcome that for people. And then when people get in the car, they're like, oh, it's just a ride where I feel like actually free to do whatever I want to do in the car, and I feel very safe. But that's like a mental hurdle that people also have to get over. So in those predictions, there was no real appreciation of the adoption curve either. Right. That there would be skepticism and hesitation and that we need to take our time to bring people on this journey with us. You know, Silicon Valley has always been like move fast and break things. This was the motto of like Facebook meta for many years before they had to take down those signs on campus and put up different signs. Um, <laughs> I remember that transition. Um, you guys have historically been, if you look at all the different, um, if you look at your competitors, uh, you guys have historically been known to move slow. Like I think I saw a writer describe it as like a grandma approach, which I think a lot of folks in Silicon Valley would, would kind of like, would hate, but it seems like you guys take that, um, you're very proud of like a grandma approach. Is that, you know? Well, it's a really, really interesting question. So I'll answer first by saying like, I love my grandmother. Right, so right. That's by the way, I'm not, I am nothing wrong with grandmas. Like maybe that we want to bring grandmas back to exactly. the conversation. But exactly. this is why I ask you, it's just it's the antithesis of Silicon Valley. Exactly. No, I mean, I think you're right that, you know, we took a lot of heat for obeying traffic laws. You know, when you're building an autonomous vehicle, the first thing it does is observe the world around it and it needs to be able to comply with the laws. And the reality is that human drivers around those vehicles are not complying with the laws. And it can be really frustrating at first to be around a vehicle that's driving and stopping, coming to a full stop and not turning left on, or not turning right on red if that's not allowable in the law. And over time, of course, our vehicles start to adapt to the environment around them. And so when people first got in in San Francisco after years of not being in, they said, the driver felt very aggressive. Like it felt like a San Francisco driver. And it's like, right, because it's learning and it's adapting. And so I think on the grandma overall point though, is we have worked really hard to have safety at the center of everything that we do. And even, I mean, I remember some of the worst headlines in the old days were, these things just comply with all the laws. And I was like, you know what, we'll take it. And so like, that makes us like grandma energy because we're like complying with the laws, being cautious, going slow, making sure that people feel safe in the vehicles before um, we actually scale in a particular jurisdiction. Like, I think that's the right approach. I, other folks have taken, a different approach. You have um, Cruise, which is the autonomous arm, uh, the autonomous driving arm of General Motors, had its testing permit revoked after an incident. I mean, talk about a bad incident and a bad headline too. Like yeah. a cruise car dragged a woman 20 feet, seven miles per hour, landed on top of her. December Tesla recalled two million vehicles to make sure drivers weren't using autopilot incorrectly. Um, and this came out after a larger inv investigation that it played a role in 17 deaths. Um, people are already skeptical. People are already fearful of new technology. Um, what have you learned from your competitors' mistakes? I think um, 
trust is something you have to tr work hard to earn every single day. Um, I think we don't take for granted anyone in this audience who has taken a ride, you know, they've put their lives in our hands and we don't take that for granted. And so not only do you have to work hard every day to earn this trust, but also it's a reminder that it's really, really easy to lose trust. And so um, making sure that we're ha we have the right decision-making culture within the company and the right engagement model with regulators and the public. It's something we've always done. It's just like a very loud reminder of that. And then I think the other thing that it's really reminded me of is one of the things I was most excited when I showed up at Waymo, because thinking about going out there as a policy professional, it's, you know, you're representing the company's intentions to third parties. And so being in the company and making sure that what you're saying is what you see that we're doing. And I think the humility of, we refer to our employees as Waymanots, um, the humility of Waymanots, you know, brilliant, hardworking, really passionate, mission-oriented group of people who have the humility to go slow, who have the humility to learn. You know, we sort of have this internal learning culture. So that's the other thing that I've really sort of been reminded of is it takes the right kind of people coming together on this mission, and they have to be focused on the company's mission as a whole, and then they have to have this special, like, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, Lori, you know? I mean, <laughs> well, that, that's what I'm saying. You see these headlines, and, and there's more of an appetite for risk for human drivers making mistakes than there is for an autonomous vehicle making mistakes. This is one of the biggest, I think, psychological things about these, but you see these headlines and you're like, oh, we are so far away from driverless cars. I can imagine when you guys behind the scenes see these, these headlines, it certainly impacts yeah. what, when you talk about building public trust, yes. it's hard for you to say, oh, well, it's not one size fits all. That's right. I think it's important. What, one of the things we always try to do is remind people, we build our hardware and our software stack, our compute power, everything internally ourselves. And so the technologies are not the same. We do remind people of that. However, you know, if you look at the polling data, it does murk, it does cloud what people think. It, it is challenging for, you know, consumers to understand what's the difference between the Waymo driver and Tesla, as you said, and, and others. Um, what one, is it? Yeah, I was gonna say, one thing that's really important though is that, you know, there are the levels of autonomy and we sort of think of them, there's five levels of autonomy, and we think of them as any three, two, and one, you need a driver's license, and you need to be behind the wheel. Four and five, you don't need a driver's license, and you don't need to be behind the wheel. In 2013, we did what sort of today is referred to as autopilot. We had an autopilot capability. We allowed employees to take cars to and from work, um, we told them, this is on the 101 in San Francisco, we told them, you know, you're being recorded, we need you to pay attention, this is not prime time ready. And what we learned immediately is people trust the technology beyond its capability. And so we saw people shaving, we saw people checking emails, <laughs> we saw people turned all the way around, and we're like, you know, I mean, I wasn't there at the time, but at the time the director of safety for Waymo was like, no, he had come to us from NHTSA, and he was like, no, we're stopping this program. That was actually the time when we decided if we really want to make the road safer, like if this is actually what we're here for, then we have to focus on level four and above, which means you don't have to have a driver's license, you don't have to sit behind the driver's seat. In our fleet of vehicles across all four of the cities that we're talking about where we are offering rider only, there's no one behind the driver's seat. There's no one in that seat. You can get in, you can sit in the passenger seat, you can sit in the back, for those of you who haven't ridden in one. So there's no confusion about who's doing the driving task. Right. The Waymo driver's doing the driver task, driving task. In the case of Tesla and you know, others, of course, it's still in that hybrid level two, level three. Um, so that's one of the biggest differences. So take me to the strategy room behind the scenes where none of us get to go at your super secret. I don't know if it's a super secret, but it feels better when I say it in that way. <laughs> like your super secret Waymo lab. Um, how are you guys, and, and by the way, I'm gonna get to some of these because some of these are on my list, guys, great questions. Um, how, 
how are you thinking about educating people on, on the gap? Because there is a gap between what we're comfortable with, and maybe not so much folks in this room are like, I think techie folks who are a little bit more um, the first ones to jump in an autonomous vehicle. But what are you guys thinking? What is the strategy for getting, um, moving beyond Silicon Valley and getting folks really understanding what it's like to drive in these cars, what they're there for? Um, what do you guys talk about behind the scenes? So we, in our not so secret, but sort of secret room, talk about the need for community engagement. Um, you know, there are companies and organizations that have for years been either trying to make roads safer or have been trying to make transportation more accessible to more people. And, you know, despite years and years of really hard work, the roads still, you know, we still talk about 40,000 people every year killed on US roads and one point, I think it was three, five million globally, um, annually, and, you know, 500 children a day, right? These are catastrophic numbers. And so there are organizations who are thinking about how to get more people home safely every day. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, National Safety Council, AAA, just to name a few. And so in every community in which we operate, not only with those kind of national partners, we've also identified local partners, like here in Austin, we're working with the Austin, Austin School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, we've partnered with them. Why? Because, you know, their students, you know, their constituencies, when they turn 16 are not gonna have the same driver's license experience that I had. Now, whether or not I was safe and I should have had that and anyone should have given me a license is a whole different issue of whether or not I was safe <laughs> to be behind the wheel. But the reality is this is an opportunity to expand access to mobility choices. And so partnering with those organizations, having like a genuine shared interest, you wanna make the road safer, you have a constituency that wants greater independence. Let's partner together. And so then these communities become among the first that have access to our technology. And that's really special to us because one, it gives us the chance to create better products. Like we are constantly learning and we've had product improvements that anyone who's taken a Waymo sees today because of these partnerships because you know, Sometimes the things we're thinking that could be really useful are not. And one, just one example that I always love because I was around these tables for many, many years when we were doing these early tests in Phoenix and it was the, um, some of our visually impaired users were like, I come out of the mall and how do I know if there's a bunch of Waymos, which Waymo's mine? Like, I'm a, what if I get in the wrong one? Mm. And so we created a like horn honking feature on the app so they could like wayfind by hearing and getting to the right vehicle. And so these are the kinds of improvements over time and the kind of feedback. And so I also think not only is it education, it's co-creating this product. You know, we don't think we are just doing a one-way product. It's actually a product that's being co-created. We oftentimes think about Silicon Valley when we think about driverless vehicles. Um, you, you just kind of spoke to it a little bit, but I'm curious, who do you see as the typical Waymo rider down the line? Everyone who wants to move safely and freely. Like, honestly, I think of it, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, what's the difference? I was just actually asked this last night. You know, what's the difference between this and like ride hailing or ride sharing? And I'm like, hmm, let me count the ways. <laughs> so one, it's a consistent experience because you know we have the Jaguar I-Pace um, as our vehicle, fully electric fleet. We send them back to base, they're clean, you know, um, one. Two, it's extremely comfortable. Three, we have an iHeartRadio, um, our iHeart Media partnership, so you get to get in there and find your own music. You don't have to take over someone else's music or someone else's car. Um, and then it's safe and it's comfortable. And so I think, you know, it's hard for people to imagine how much it can apply to everyone's use case. Yeah. My son, to me, you know, he's 14 and he can be skeptical like a teenager. Um, but he gets in and he's reminded often that, oh, I don't have to whisper. Like, mommy, why am I whispering? 
And I'm like, yeah, there's no one here listening to our conversation. And so those are the adjustments that people have just made. You get into an Uber and you're like, oh, Lori, right. you know, where'd you get your pants? They're so cool. <laughs> and you get to have that conversation, but you just don't want to do that in front of a stranger. So there are these adaptations that everyone will have the chance to make. But I really think it's anyone who wants to be able to move around freely um, without needing someone to take them from point A to point B. Talk to me about the complex technical challenges, right? You, you mentioned this earlier. What is the biggest technical challenge you face in getting these vehicles all over? I think it just depends. Every jurisdiction is different. And certainly in the early days, we were learning how to navigate. You know, In Phoenix, we had to figure out sandstorms. Um, and then this something with birds, like there were birds just were very drawn to our vehicles. Um, and so, you know, birds can create a lot of mess. And so think about like windshield wipers are on the cars, but if you, if the car is being driven by the Waymo driver, you need windshield wipers on the sensors and on the cameras and on the LIDAR, you know, the technology that's designed to see the world around it. Um, we've tested heat in Death Valley. We've tested thunderstorms in Miami, you know, snow in Detroit. You know, there are a lot of weather conditions, black ice, that the Waymo driver will have to master in order to move into those markets full time. So you see us like starting in weather that's a little more favorable. We certainly had to learn fog in San Francisco. Then when you think about San Francisco, it's like double parked vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, you know, five-way intersections, trams, trains, you know, making sure that the driver has the capability to do all of that. And so when you, once you spend time in the Waymo service, I've had a lot of people say this to me, and it's my own experience, you start to actually scan the environment around you as a human driver very differently because you appreciate how many things are going on and how many things can go wrong. And so our vehicle is doing that, you know, many, many times every second around it. You know, there's a few questions the car, the technology has to ask in order to do the driving task. First and foremost is like, where am I? And so what's, you know, what's the scene? And then second is what's around me? What are these agents? You know, where's their car? A truck, a human, a construction site, a flag, a stop sign, a yellow light, a yield, a child, a pedestrian, an Amazon truck. And then what are they most likely to do next? Mm. And which is sort of like the prediction and planning path. And so they're gonna go this way and they're gonna go that way. And you know, there's all of these lines that sort of happen every second. And then therefore, what should I do? And when you're in a Waymo vehicle, there's a screen, whether you're in the front or the back, in front of you. And what it doesn't show you all of that. We used to show that and it didn't actually comfort people. So we <laughs> downscope that screen. And so instead, what it shows you is just the cars, the trucks, the pedestrians, cones, because you want confidence that this thing sees that there's a construction site. And then it shows you the path that the Waymo car is taking you on. Hmm. And that's really helpful for people. One, because they're like, oh, it sees that kid. It sees that kid's chasing a ball. It's showing me which way I'm going. Um, and so over time, we figured out like how to give you enough clues about the technology that you're like, okay, I understand what's, what's happening. I think that's, it's such an interesting, the psychology um, and how you think about human psychology as it pertains to these vehicles. Because I'm listening to you talk about all this, oh, it has to learn fog and black ice. I'm like, I don't want to be part of the learning of fog and black ice, right? Like, so, you know, for folks to, um, I imagine there's a psychological barrier that people have when it comes to getting into a fully autonomous vehicle. And I think you, it was you that said this to me. It's like, in order to create a sense of autonomy for this to work, human beings have to give up a sense of autonomy. Mm -hmm. How do you design technically experience that makes us feel both safe, but also that we've given up autonomy? <laughs> like, it's a technical challenge, I imagine. It is, it is. It's a little bit of the screen that I just described, like giving you confidence. But I think there is a part of, you know, I think it's part of what we're all learning about AI right now, which is, when you as a human give up your autonomy, what you're given isn't necessarily the same as what you would do. And that's part of the deal, right? Is it's like one of the biggest areas of feedback that we got in our first 
few years of driving people around the Phoenix metro area is routing. Like, why doesn't this thing take me the way I go? <laughs> and it's like, I, there could be a hundred reasons at a different, different points of the day, but what we know is it sees 360 degrees, almost three football fields away. So it has more data at all times than you have when you're driving. And so maybe sometimes on your route, you actually run into an accident. You actually, that's an accident that the Waymo driver is avoiding entirely. Or sometimes there's more congestion on that route than another route. And so I think this notion of, you know, the value exchange, I'm giving up this level of measured autonomy to arrive safely and securely. I think over time people get used to it, but we get a lot of feedback about that. I mean, my mom still argues with Uber drivers. She's like, that's not the, that's not the route. So I can imagine it's gonna be harder when people can argue with something that's not gonna argue back. <laughs> there is a psychological, that's a weird one. I, agree. I think that's right. I've been in the car with people who've been um, giving directions to the Waymo driver, but the Waymo driver does not hear them, <laughs> does not get distracted. Is there any product design that it's like it gently nods and ignores it? Or not, it's not even nodding. I don't even know how I'm speaking about it, but is there like, is there gonna be any acknowledgement or is it just like, I know what's best? No, there's no, I mean, if the person, so when you're in the vehicle, you can push the rider support button. Yeah. Um, I think if you push the rider support button and ask them, why is it routing this way? It'll, it, it, they will welcome you to sit back and enjoy the, enjoy the ride. Like how? <laughs> because they can't actually drive the vehicle. Like right. it's all happening on board. Uh, but it's funny for me because I was in the car with someone who was like, why is it going this way? This isn't the way that I normally go. And I'm like, what do you want to do about it? And so she pushed rider support. And rider support's like, can I help you? And she's like, yeah, this thing is not going the way that I expected it to go. And they were like, is there a, is there a problem? Oh, no. <laughs> but did it play soothing music? Or like, or it was just like. No, you can play it though. You can, you can choose your own music. You can choose your own adventure. Um, but I, I think what you're getting at is it hasn't been my experience that people don't adapt really yeah. quickly. Like there's this, what if this and what if that? And oh my gosh, and da da da. And then especially skeptics yeah. come out. I mean, I've been standing there to meet with various skeptics and they're like, the future's now, it's here. And I'm like, well, that was easy. And that guy's playing like saxophone in the back. I saw the future, I see it. Um, but in order for the future to come, it has to deal with, you gotta deal with a lot of these regulatory challenges, which I mean, it certainly seems with your background, this is something you're prepared to do. On Monday here at South by the Austin mayor, I don't know if anyone saw the Austin mayor speak, um, but he criticized the arrival of self-driving cars. He said that companies deploying these self-driving cars need to work more closely with cities to avoid costly failures and address safety concerns. And his direct quote, and I give it to you all just so you can respond, um, is I'm all for profit margins and stuff, but ultimately the public good has to play a role in this and it shouldn't be sacrificed and it shouldn't be secondary to the profit uh, of the private entity. It's only fair that you get to respond. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, you know, not all companies are created equal. I think that we've definitely been focused on deep engagement from the beginning um, at all levels of government. I don't think there's another way to do this. And, um, you know, before we showed up here in Austin, we were working with not only local community groups, but we were also training first responders um, on how to actually engage to your, to your question, you know, what do you do when you actually are trying to pull over a vehicle that doesn't have a driver behind the wheel and there's a passenger in there? We've, we've trained thousands of first responders in Arizona, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and now here. It's really important that we allow everyone in the ecosystem who has a role to play, to play that role and to play it best, right? Because, I mean, the mayor, was elected in order to give the people of Austin a livable city and a livable community. So we understand that. So we want to engage. We want to engage in a way that makes us part of the community. We don't want to be at odds with the community. And so, you know, I get it. I totally understand. And I think our team is engaging, always will engage. Um, and we also hope that as people 
incorporate this into their lives, they will start speaking on our behalf too, because that's what we saw in San Francisco. We can say whatever we want to say, but it's actually the people who, you know, can't get into Uber and Lyft with their seeing eye dog. You know, how many times the driver has left them on the side of the road, how many times they've had to request another one and another one, and the first Waymo shows up, them and their dog get in and they get where they're going. And so those kinds of distinctions in actual, in the case of the mayor, you know, residents, citizens, voters, however you want to think of them, their actual lives are improved. And that's what we care about. And, you know, whether that's about profit margin or about good business, it's not really the right debate, I don't think. Um, a debate that a lot of people will have the second you say autonomous vehicles is about the future of jobs. Um, what do you tell Uber drivers? What do you, I mean, are you allowed to go into Ubers and tell them what you're doing? Like, what do you tell taxi drivers who worry that their jobs are gonna be taken um, by a driverless car in the future? Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations with drivers. I actually have friends who are uh, Uber drivers on the East Coast, and they ask me this, like, what do, you, what do you say? And I think, you know, a lot of the jobs that people at Waymo have didn't exist 15 years ago. And so I just think it's really important to not have an ahistoric view of the labor market. I mean, it evolves over time, and one of the best parts of being at Waymo has been watching us hire people from traditional sectors of the economy whose jobs have actually sort of gone away and now they've had the chance to train this technology because you know we've hired CDLs, we've hired people from traditional industries to help us because they're experts in road safety, they're experts in operating, you know, large vehicles and so we support a lot of studies around job transition. What I like to say, what I like to think when I look at the jobs for my son's generation is there's going to be so many jobs available because this technology exists, because of the transition that's happening that just aren't available today. Do you ever get like a, I like the response. It is a CEO response. So like, do you ever, how do you deal with the emotion of, of folks who, who just say, like, this job might not even exist anymore? Like, I think, yeah, I think it's a fair, I think first and foremost, we have to acknowledge it. It's yeah. true. And so that was the first part of what I said. So let me, let me pause on that for a moment. Like, we're not hiding from that fact. Like, it is true that jobs are gonna go away. Um, and when we were doing trucking, um, I got the question a lot and you know my uncle was a truck driver and that job meant so much to him um, and the reality is my uncle lost his life on the road having a heart attack in his truck it was a hard job and so I don't take questions of jobs job opportunities job loss lightly at all I just think it's hard to convey that there will be workforce transition opportunities. We have a partnership in Los Angeles where we've started ushering in some of that workforce training around autonomy, around the kinds of jobs. You know, we've worked with AutoNation, which is one of our partners. They have techs and mechanics who work on vehicles. Their highest level of certification is if you get to work on a Waymo vehicle, right? Because now you're not just doing tires, and hardware and the normal, you're actually working on lasers and um, LIDAR and radar and cameras in our sensor suite and you're changing tires and doing all the other things. So there are a lot of examples like that of the kinds of jobs that will exist. Now on the human level, you know, this isn't gonna happen overnight. And when I, before I joined Waymo, I heard a think tank in DC say four million jobs would be lost in the year 2018 because of self-driving cars. It just wasn't the case. And so I know that it's just gonna be like a slower transition and a transition that we get to sort of manage and navigate together over time as a society. So I think of the question as being like, what's gonna happen on that day when all the jobs are gone? Yeah. And I'm answering a different question, which is the question of, 
How are we going to usher this in as a society? And we're going to usher it in as a society gradually and over time and with a different type of job set yeah. and a different type of opportunity. Is part of what happened to your, uh, you talk about losing your uncle um, and being on the road, is part of why that, and is that why part of this is personal to you? Definitely. I think that there's just a complacency about, you know, 40,000 people not making it home uh, for dinner or making it to the next birthday um, and taking that as just the state of the state. And not only did I lose my uncle that way, but I lost two other uncles, one from a drunk driver and one from a red light runner. And, you know, the reality is when I joined Waymo, I too thought of those things as like, just the way it is, right? Like you get in your car and it's a little bit of a crapshoot sometimes and sometimes you don't make it home. And then working on this technology made me really challenge myself to be less accepting of the status quo. And people, you know, I get so many questions about skepticism and, you know, is it safe enough? And, and all of it's reasonable to me. I just think, though, about myself as a 16-year-old. You know, I was an A student, so there was no question about whether I was going to pass the driving test. That did not mean that someone should have allowed me to drive that car. Like, yes, I'm going to ace the test. And if you tell me how to get around these cones, I'm going to get around them. But the reality is that we don't actually come up with a way to make sure that drivers are safe drivers and make sure that those 40,000 people's lives are spared. And so this technology, I, I really started to get excited about getting uncomfortable about the status quo. Okay. And so to me, when people ask me, like, are you sure this technology is safe? Are you sure? I am sure. Now we have studies that I can actually quote um, because we hit, you know, we've now given over one million uh, rides and we give tens of thousands every week, but at s when we had about um, seven million miles of driverless, we did a study and we published it. Anyone who's interested, we published tons of safety papers. And what we were able to show is that the Waymo driver is like six times less likely than a human to get into a crash that causes an injury. Um, when we were around 4 million miles, we partnered with Swiss Re, which is a, the largest reinsurer, and we discovered that 100% of personal injury claims were eliminated, 100%, and 76% of property damage claims. And so now we're getting into the part where, like, frankly, as like kind of a nerd, it's, a, it's like getting exciting because now we're having data-backed conversations. Now we're able to actually take all the, all the miles we've driven, all the trips, all of our hypotheses around that table and really start to partner with third-party groups and see whether or not we have the opportunity to statistically improve the state of the roads. And right now we feel really, really confident that we do. And as these cars become more mainstream, there will be lots of questions that as human beings, we make all the, we, we assess things all the time. We make decisions. Sometimes we don't make great decisions, but we make decisions. How are you going to code morality into these vehicles? I know this is something people kind of talk about and it seems far away. Like how will the self-driving car make a decision if something's going to happen to hurt this person or that person? I mean, Take us back to that super secret room that we were talking about earlier and like give us a sense of like what you guys are thinking and who's coding these vehicles to make tough decisions. Yeah, so the vehicles are driving to make a decision to avoid that entirely. Um, it goes a little bit to what I said before. You know, one of the reasons that human drivers are sometimes in that situation is you know, not having the same amount of data available to it. And so we really, really think of the driver as a conservative driver. When in doubt, it's gonna slow down, it's gonna pull over, it's gonna stop driving. And it gets back to why people in communities used to find it frustrating. You know, that said, we know there will be incidents where 
something will jump out at the very last second, but we aren't making a decision between like the person in the car and the person outside of the car. We are always trying to avoid hitting anything. Like that is the way that the driver is designed. We know we won't be perfect. You know, that's probably one of the harder conversations that we have to have around that table is we are here to improve road safety and we know that things are gonna happen on the roads. And that's a really, you know, it's something that the culture at the company grapples with honestly and openly, um, and it's challenging, but the traditional trolley problem of a human driver, we think we should be able to avoid just based on the amount of data that the driver is constantly sort of evaluating. Has there been anything behind the scenes you could give us a taste of, right, where you guys had these conversations and that was we, a little complicated? Yeah, we don't have that kind of conversation, um, this sort of trolley problem conversation. We have a lot of conversations though about, you know, our regulatory, I mean, our verification and validation methodology, which is in our safety report, is something that we developed ourselves. You know, you have to have a really strong sense of what the technology is capable of doing and a really, really, really rigorous safety culture in order to stay true to it. And I would say those are some of the most challenging and also the conversations that make me proudest about the company. You know, we will announce that we are doing something and if it does not stay in line with our safety bar, we will pull back mm -hmm. and we won't continue to do it. And those have been, those are the kinds of, you know, we've built this rigorous approach, now how do we adhere to this rigorous approach despite the demand outside of the company for us to go faster, for us to serve more people, for us to, and we've just stayed very disciplined around not doing that. Those are probably some of the hardest conversations. We have a couple minutes before I wanna to get to some audience questions. Um, I'd love to ask you just like a couple personal, I mean, not so personal, but like, let's go a little personal <laughs> questions. Um, I, I'm bracing myself. All I know. Of a sudden, I know. Oh. I'm like, I'm like, how personal should we go? No, I do think it's interesting. You grew up in Mississippi. You lived in Georgia, Texas, Virginia. You lived like far from Silicon Valley. I'm curious um, how this shaped your view of driverless cars. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine this is something you were growing up thinking no. about in Mississippi. I could be wrong. I thought about lots of weird things in Georgia. No. So like, I, you know. No, I mean, it's a little bit of why I bring with a lot of humility, because I do recognize that in the role, I have, to, I have to be careful. But as a human, it's why I bring so much optimism to the jobs question, because this isn't a job that I could have imagined having. Um, is it, it, isn't a, it isn't a technology pursuit that I was thinking about earlier in my career. And I do think there's something, um, about sort of being raised by my grandmother and my parents who I love dearly. Um, they set me out into the world to figure out what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. And I think there's something about doing something that's never been done before that I say that's what this prepa it prepared me for this, which is like constantly asking the questions that need to be asked to keep ourselves honest with ourselves. And so deep value system, and then like a creative spirit. Hmm. Great. I, um, I, um, I have this concept of a lobster moment. Go with me for one minute. Um, <laughs> okay. When, and this is, I promise, I have a book and it comes out, in the book we talk about a lobster moment. When a lobster, and I, it's all stemmed from a YouTube video of a rabbi talking about how lobsters grow. I know, it's weird. Um, but when a lobster grows, the only way for it to get bigger the only way for it to get bigger is for it to completely shed its shell. And yeah. it is the most stressful, uncomfortable moment in a lobster's life. Yeah. And I thought about a lot of this having interviewed entrepreneurs my whole career, right? Entrepreneurs who go through lobster moments all the time to get into a grow into a new shell. And I think anyone who is leading a company as influential as something that's like autonomous vehicles has probably had many a lobster moments in their career. I'm curious if you could give us a sense of uh, the discomfort, the vulnerability that potentially has led to a larger shell for you and personally in your career. Yeah, okay, so your lobster moment is my butterfly moment, so I love that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Definitely, I think, 
the humility that it takes every single day um, to examine whether or not we're making the right decisions. Like it's a lot of trusting my gut. There isn't a playbook for what we're doing. And it is possible for us to make decisions that are not judged as right, are not perceived as right, are not applauded, um, even if the technology is improving road safety. And I think that sort of constantly needing to check in and trust myself in a way I haven't. You said like mass surveillance. I mean, I've worked on really stressful stuff, but there's a bit of a playbook that exists for those things and there isn't one for this. So that's definitely been one of the biggest lobster moments. And then I would say secondly, you know, any, I think CEO would say this, 2023 was a really, really challenging sort of post pandemic, you know, what are we doing? How are we collaborating? Are we back in the office? Are we not back in the office? And so leading the company through that year, um, it, was a cha it was a challenging, wonderful, rewarding, you know, we made a lot of progress, but like keeping the culture intact uh, was definitely the challenge of last year. What was the hardest part of that? Having, not having everyone back together. And so having splintering that we hadn't had before and then needing to be honest with ourselves about what was needed. So rebooting our values, rebooting our mission, you know, that's some of the work that Dimitri and I turned to. And I think of those as those kinds of moments because you can build a great product, but you have to build a great company and a great culture and people who feel good about what we're doing. Cool. Well, I want to get to audience questions. Um, what's your roadmap for Europe? I like that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, roadmap for Europe. We're definitely interested in expa expanding internationally. Nothing to share, though, specifically right now. But if you had to? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I tried for you. I, I even did that. the follow-up. Okay, um, let's see. We covered the technical challenges. Um, how will Waymo meet periods of high demand? Even without humans, you need a lot of cars to meet demand at events like South by Southwest. Surge pricing? God, do you guys remember when Uber did surge pricing around here for the first time? That was crazy. What do you think? Yeah, we have an optimization algorithm, and so we will meet demand based on the amount of people opening the app and demanding rides. How are regulators on the state and federal level supposed to create the right legal frameworks to balance safety and innovation? So I think, you know, the way that regulating um, cars historically has been is the federal agencies, so NHTSA and FMCSA, are the ones who regulate the safety of the vehicle, and state regulates the safety of the driver, licensing, titling, registration, et cetera. Um, we think that's still the right approach. We think that the federal government has an opportunity to play a role here in making sure that all players are safe and can put their cars on the road. Um, will Waymo and the use of privately owned autonomous vehicles ultimately be prodded by the insurance industry due to autonomous vehicles being safer than humans? Ultimately be prodded by? I'm I not mean, sure what. Who asked the question? Okay. John Kunwe? Is like John? Oh, about? thank you, John. Oh, interesting. Uh, certainly, um, over time, we expect insurance rates will reduce, especially as we look at the, the data that's coming out about how much safer we're going to make cars. And so I think the way I think about your question is how the price per mile over time will drop, even for personal car ownership. And so possibly, possibly. This one's a kind of more uh, detailed question. I think it's a good question. Thank you, Ben. Um, typical cost of a ride with Waymo, and are you able to charge more than the traditional ride shares, or do consumers want to pay less knowing there is no, uh, no driver? I mean, what is that behavior? Yeah, so it depends on time of day and day of week, right? I mean, I think there can be a little bit of a mindset of people go both ways. Some people are like, it's a luxury, it's a luxury vehicle, it's an EV, I'm supporting the environment, I expect to pay more, it's a nascent technology. Other people have the exact opposite. There's no driver. Why wasn't this cheaper? And so for us, it really depends on the time of day. It goes back to the algorithm. What time are you asking for the vehicle? And is it in high demand? And if so, prices are probably a little higher. 
Um, how will you, uh, Ricardo wants to know how you will expand, only direct or are you planning to release the technology? Um, so we definitely have, you know, we do ride hailing on our roadmap. We also plan to have delivery, local delivery. We've done that with Safeway in San Francisco. Will people come out and get their groceries? Yes, they will. That's great. Um, and we also have done Class 8 trucking, which is something that we'll pick up later. Um, and then we will partner with automotive companies and license our technology to them. So, you know, ride hailing is what we're talking about today and what we're doing right now, but we definitely have a multi sort of business line approach to this technology over time. I know you were humble and you said there's a lot of humility about making predictions, but if I could, um, when will every person in this audience be able to ride in an autonomous vehicle? Do you have a time frame? I mean, today, if you go to San Francisco or Phoenix. But like around the whole country, <laughs> when are these going to, when do you see mass yeah. adoption? Yeah, it's a hard question to answer. She's like, she's like I don't want you quoting me in two years <laughs> being like it, it was going to happen and it wasn't. How about like, could we give like, I'm just going to work around it until we get somewhere. How about like a time frame of like five years, 10 years? Yeah, I mean, what are we, what the, the question you're asking requires me to think about what am I optimizing for? We could go to every major city in the US and plant a flag and stand up a service and you know, compete with the local options that are available. Um, the reason that we take the approach that we're taking is we want to build a full service. We want to see that it's actually integrated into people's lives and then we'll move to the next city. So depends on which approach we take over the next five to 10 years. That's the way that I would think about it. And it also depends, you know, how, how does this change people's lives? How does it change how we move? You know, there's a lot that goes into it. There are whole ecosystems that are being developed around these changes yeah. too, right? Like cities are now thinking about, well, I mean, if you're here, maybe I don't have to spend $60 million on that parking structure. You know, maybe that parking structure can go away and that becomes a new park. So there's a lot, and they're doing it on like a four to six year city planning time horizon. So we get these questions from every angle and there's just a lot of ecosystem shifting that has to happen over time. Great, um, Sebastian wants to know, at what point do you change the form factor of the vehicle interior? Outward steering wheel, driver's seat, all becomes unnecessary as full autonomy. Good question, Sebastian. Yeah, I really, I really like that question. Right Everyone's now, had a great question. Yeah, yeah, no, really they're all great. great. <laughs> um, and, and yours are great. <laughs> it's okay, um, everything's great. <laughs> so the vehicle form factor, uh, removing sort of steering wheel and all of that does require a regulatory change right now, and so it's not what we're focused on, but that is something I could imagine changing in the next five to 10 years. I think one of the most interesting ideas, people are always giving me their ideas for what they'd like to do in a Waymo, um, and someone told me what I'll be most excited about is when your Waymo interior is a yoga studio or has a Peloton in it. <laughs> and so there's a lot of people waiting for these form factors. Wow. But right now we can't remove the driver controls. What do you think that could look like if, let's say, regulatory, all that kind of stuff down the line in the time frame you won't quite give me, but let's see, like down the line, what do you think it, it could look like? What could a form factor look like that's different? Yeah, I mean, imagine it just feeling like sitting around a dining room table, yeah. right? Like you're, you, have a, you have to go from, you know, San Jose to San Francisco or LA to, you know, wherever. Um, and for an hour, you and your team just get to sit at this table and have a meeting. Mm. And the vehicle's just taking you where you need to go. And there isn't, it's not oriented around a driver. And there are no side view mirrors, there are no rear view mirrors, there's no steering wheel. Um, and I think for the yoga person, there's no table. And it's just a platform and you get to have, you know, meditation music to your point, And you just get to have a space to yourself and get safely from point A to point B. We've got, to, uh, we've got to wrap, but I want to ask you one more question. I've asked, I always like asking tech CEOs this question, um, and I've asked every tech CEO I've interviewed this one question. Um, when it comes to the future of technology and humans, what is the number, the, the single most important ethical question you think we need to be asking at this current moment? I think for me, the question that I always sit with is, is it technology for technology safe? for technology's sake, or is there a clear value exchange? 
because you know I'm someone who likes to live in the real world. Um, I, I don't live on social media. I don't share pictures there. You know, I live in this world. And the value exchange to me is actually going to make my human existence more meaningful. And so that to me is the question we have to keep asking ourselves is are we not making the technology more fanciful, but is the technology actually making the opportunity for humans to connect with humans and be human and be their best human selves? And if so, then I think the value exchange becomes clearer. Great. Takeda, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Laurie. all. Thanks.